2021 was the year of the record. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Vancouver Life Real Estate Podcast with myself, Dan Wartell, and Ryan Dash as your hosts. Uh, as we touched on just off the top there, basically every real estate record ever was essentially set or broken in 2021. And we're going to touch on a couple of those right now. Um, but first off, I want to kind of just give you guys an outline of our upcoming podcast through the holiday season uh, because we have lots to share and we kind of don't stop working. So there will be a podcast released uh, on the next two Saturdays, meaning, yes, Christmas Day, we are releasing a podcast that is uh, the one that's going to analyze and go over all of our 2021 predictions that we made back in January. Again, which ones we hit right, which ones that we hit wrong, and of course, why. And um, and kind of just dig into what happened. And obviously, it was a very unique year, very hard to predict, but we'll see which ones we actually guessed right. And we then, definitely don't get anything wrong, Dan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Anyone can predict 12 months of real estate in Canada. Um, and then on Saturday the 1st, the first day of 2022, we are releasing our 2022 predictions. What we see happening in the upcoming year in Canadian and especially Vancouver real estate and basically what to be prepared for. You know, what position you're in and how we can help set you up for success. Yeah, totally. Um, and in the short term here, I think maybe let's get into it and um, maybe Dan, I think we should start on what, what's going to happen short term with uh, Omicron here. Um, I think one thing uh, before we jump into it, I just want to put into the listeners ears uh, a very important concept for today's podcast. There is what's possible, what's ethical, and then there's what's most likely to happen. <laughs> Those are, they're, they're very different things. Uh, and they sound very similar, but they're not, right? Plausible and possible, very, very different, right? Okay, so what happens in the short term if Omicron takes over, right? I think um, I think we'll see a quick return to uh, lockdowns. <laughs> I think the scapegoat uh, will become Omicron to keep rates low. I think that's going to keep pushing out the um, that that inflationary target going to allow more and more sort of lending to take place. Um, but I think, you know, as we continue to see restrictions around the world start popping up, this is starting to feel oddly familiar, Dan, like we've seen this before, right? Um, so I think if we've seen it before, you know, the question is, if BC shuts down, what are we going to do? And are we going back two years, right? Are we going back 19 months? And are we going to see what happened in the real estate market repeat itself? I don't think that's even possible with the levels of inventory we've got now, but it does put a big question mark on, on a lot of things, right? It really does. I mean, if we've seen anything in the last two years, it's the ability for the policymakers to politicize a virus or, or almost mm -hmm. anything for that matter. Mm -hmm. And and they can use that and to kind of push their narrative in any direction. So regardless of the threat, real, imagined, or otherwise, uh, they can kind of shape it to push forward policies that, um, you know, favor essentially the wealthy is what we've kind of seen lately. You know, yeah. there's intent there, whether, you know, you consider it good or bad, it's happening kind of either way. So yes, like Ryan said, there may be more shutdowns. I mean, you know, they're announcing nine days before Christmas to maybe not see family and maybe not travel. And of course, this was not what they were saying six months ago. Yes, we understand things change with viruses. I'm certainly not a virus expert, but we do live in a world where we are getting policies pushed down to us that seem to be changing almost daily. Well, and, and some there's some questions around the science of it too. I mean, I know like, you know, we don't truly understand Omicron yet or Omicron yet. And, and you know, we've already got travel bans in place. I get it. It's to slow down the spread, right? But at the same time, do we know if it's as deadly or less deadly or is it more contagious? We know it's more a bit more contagious, but to what extent? And then, you know, you've got companies like WestJet who came out yesterday and said, you know, this is just going to delay economic recovery. There's no science based on this. This is hype, you know. Um, and there's some, it's definitely feeling political, you know. I'm still trying to scratch my head around why, but um, I guess we haven't seen the whole plan play out yet. 
Yeah, <laughs> and I think the point of this comment really is that, look, if the virus continues to mutate, if they continue to keep things shut down economy-wise, then they will feel justified in further stimulus. And we know what happens to assets in a stimulated environment. So keep an eye on that. Uh, we'll touch a lot more on it in the next, uh, on the January 1st episode for you. And of course, it's going to be a lot more information and data out by then regarding the virus. So um, we'll, we'll touch on that then too. Um, okay, so a couple of important things we wanted to touch on today. Um, one ratio that is an important one that we watch is the household debt service ratio. And this basically represents the share of disposable income that is needed to service the principal and interest payments on outstanding debt owned by, or owed rather, by households. Uh, late 2019 is when we last saw this peak, high being that it's harder to pay or that you're using more of your disposable income. Um, and since then, for about the last two years, two and a half years, it's been falling sharply. So outside of the anomaly of Q2 of 2020, when it was really an outlier because everything just stopped altogether and nobody was paying mortgages thanks to uh, the deferral uh, option that uh, the banks gave people, um, the ratio right now sits at the lowest it has been in 16 years, dating back to 2005. Uh, it's right now about 13.5%. 13.5% of disposable income going towards those payments. This is down from 15, 1.5% back in 2019. Um, so you take that, you, you consider the still double digit savings ratio that's happening in uh, Canadian bank accounts and you get a good understanding of the capacity to absorb future rate hikes without feeling too much financial pressure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I do. I definitely agree. Um, I just wonder if people are saving at a rate that is outpacing um, the cost of money printing. So, you know, I mean, if, if we've printed 20% more money this year, um, you know, and saving rates are, are high, great. But if we increase interest rate hikes, and I mean, depending on what you read and, and who you're listening to, <clears throat> there could be anywhere from two to five interest rate hikes next year. Um, <clears throat> and that could erode savings pretty quick, right? There's a lot of what ifs, what ifs in, that, in that, side of, um, that side of the world. And, and as we continue to print money, we continue to increase inflation. We, inc in, you know, continue to debase our currency and that, you know, it looks better on paper, but again, people are paying more for things and they're paying more faster for things. So really, are we saving all that much? I, I don't know yet. I, I want to see how this plays out. Um, just because I'm not, I'm not convinced that it'll work, but I guess it depends on how much money gets printed. Yeah, for sure. And we know uh, jobs, wages are rising as well, which is going to help curb that too. So a lot of determining factors here. Uh, I think really my main point to this is likely that if we see two, three, four rate hikes next year, don't expect to feel panic out, out there in the marketplace. Don't expect to see people have, having to sell off or, or yeah. even start to be late on mortgages. I mean, let's look back to, uh, remember when the mortgage deferral cliff was a conversation and uh, when all those payments suddenly became due again, it's a blip on the radar. Everybody mm -hmm. paid, right? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a... A nothing burger, as I think they called it. Back then, <laughs> well, we got to remember too. I mean, the last thing that the Canadians, generally speaking, will will not pay is their mortgage. Right? They will always pay their mortgage first. That's historically been proven. So, you know, to expect a major change or blip in the market because all of a sudden people are running out of savings, I agree with you, Dan. I don't think it's going to happen next year, but I do think over a much broader time period, we're looking at a um, uh, I guess a, a debasing of our currency with these crazy rates going up, right? It's just going to take time. Okay, uh, fair. So let's move over to quick look at the Toronto and some Vancouver uh, updates here in the market, because again, the two markets have really, really aligned themselves. You know, it was used to be that uh, Toronto kind of operated three to six months, sometimes a year in advance, as far as what the property market has, uh, would do. And this year they've really kind of emulated each other. Um, but Toronto is is kind of accelerated a bit. And so we <laughs> want to give a bit of an update as to what's happening there to potentially give a projection as to what might happen in Vancouver. Um, 
because right now the rage, all the rage is in condos. Condo sales in Toronto are up 45% year over year. And they're obviously far outpacing, you know, the broader market. Um, this is due to three things. This is a return to the city for, for uh, people that are working in, in the offices that have reopened up. Um, this is quite simply that single family homes are so unaffordable. Uh, people wanting in the market often will just buy what they can. And right now that's condos because they are the lowest price asset. And then lastly, we know uh, investors are going in heavy, right? The 25% of all new mortgages are for investors. So those three elements are really charging the condo market in Toronto right now. I mean, price, uh, price has definitely accelerated at an alarming rate. The average home is up 22% in Toronto, but the HPI price is up 30%, Dan. <laughs> 30%. Yeah. Inventory. You, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, just just unsustainable, right? I mean, we're we're laughing yes. at how absurd this is. Because yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable, and yet here we are talking about it month in and month out. That's right, and and we're also you know we just talked about household savings. Well, if you add thirty percent to the average house price in Toronto, and you look at the average home savings, they're just way out of whack. Way out of whack. Um, anyhow, inventory is also down a whopping sixty percent. Over the last year, <laughs> that puts 0.8 months of inventory on the market and the average home selling at 108% of its asking price yeah, on average, remember, on average. You, yeah, exactly. If you remember here in Vancouver, we talked on it last month and I believe it was like 100.8, like 101. So prices in Toronto selling at 8% on average over ask. You know, with with inventory that tight, it's it's not a surprise. But man, these numbers are still tough to relay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, Van hey, go ahead, Van Dan. Sure, uh, Vancouver. It, you know, we're seeing similar demand with year over year sales um, highly favoring condos at thirty five percent increase, um, outpacing both other asset classes here. Um, right now, actually, you know, when you look at last month. Uh, single family home sales are down 6% from the previous year. So 35% up from for condos and 6% down for single family homes. You can clearly see where the interest is. Mm -hmm. um, here we are also at record low inventory, uh, but unlike Toronto at 0.8 months of inventory, we are sitting at two. So if you're out there and you're shopping for a home and you feel that it is tight, imagine less than half that amount of homes and you get an inkling into what it's like in Toronto right now. And hence why the price is going. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is interesting. I just pulled this up. We are recording this on Thursday, December 16th. There are 6,826 homes active on the MLS. That is a brand new, just hit all time record low. So if that sustains, and, and believe me, it will go lower. Um, it is, I'm just pulling up my numbers here. Oh yeah, it was December of 2015 when we were at 6,834. Now, yes, that's for the end of the month. So we are below that halfway through the month. Mm -hmm. And here's a terrifying number. In the first two weeks alone of December, there is another 10% less inventory than there was at the beginning of the month. I don't even really know what to say. I mean, I could either laugh or cry, depending on <laughs> let me know what you want. Yeah. <laughs> you that's know, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I'm speaking to so many realtors right now all of them talking about having buyers in the double digits looking for things, right? The mounting pressure to buy, right? And, and, and we just don't have any, anything for sale. And, and lo and behold, you know, sellers are going, well, where the hell am I going to go? There's nothing to buy, right? And um, yeah, I mean, as we hit these new all-time sales volumes, I mean, it's without a doubt we're going to start to see um, you know, policy is going, it's it, what hits the news hits the policy desk, right? Mm -hmm. So as these headlines continue to make their way across the nation, you know, I, I something's got to get, got to give here, right? Yeah, think of the recent one. We just, uh, announced at the end of November that all time sales volumes for the country of Canada hit an, an all time high new record. Well, we just did that in BC. So at the end of the November cycle, sales cycle uh, for the whole year combined, BC has set a new record. 118,000 homes have sold so far this year with the full month of data still to come into play, beating out uh, 2016 with 112,000. So Holy. 
Another Holy. record. Another record. Canada did it at the end of October, rather. They announced in November. BC just did it at the end of November. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like Ryan said, right? Policymakers, all they're hearing is, oh, record, 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 new high price, high unaffordability, all the stuff. So they're going to come in and they're going to start cracking down. And this is going to be probably a big part of our predictions as to what's going to manipulate prices in the new year. Um, realistically, they always target uh, investors first, mm -hmm. you know, these rental housing providers yeah. first, you know, the, uh, the government doesn't want to supply housing. So they leave it up to the average person, but then they make it very challenging for them. Again. It goes, goes back to the old adage, Dan, that we've been harping on for well, years as realtors, but you know, the last year and a bit on the podcast that the government always attacks demand and never ever goes after supply, right? Like we always hurt the people who are trying to get ahead in life um, by undercutting them and making it worse for everybody. Like, you know, I, I we need to have programs in place where we are allowing builders to build way faster. Like the red tape that it takes to build a home in Vancouver or the red tape it takes to put a tower up is ridiculous. And it's, it's the main issue. And we just want to attack the people who, after changing monetary policy, excuse me, take advantage of that because they're smart people. I just don't get it. To me, it's, it's people are just going to, investors will take their money to a different market and it'll, get, it'll go from bad to worse. Yeah, very true. Totally agree. They can only clamp down so much and we're seeing it, right? Especially even at a, a high level, the developers, uh, the big ones are often just sitting on land and they're holding back. They're delaying projects. They're delaying bringing houses to market because it's become unaffordable for them to do it, unprofitable. Uh, and, and again, like Ryan touched on too much red tape. They're just like, yeah. this is not worth it for us. So we're just going to sit on big chunks of land, big parcels, and ideally hope that the policies change or the, the monetary positions that they have, uh, excuse me, change as well, so that it can be uh, an environment where they're like, yes, okay, now it's time that we can move forward, we can make housing, and we can do it at a profitable position. Dan, Dan, do you remember when the government came out in the podcast and said, or sorry, not the podcast, in the election, and said that they were going to, um, that they were going to, I think it was a $4 billion fund they were going to set aside to help alleviate the red tape and time it takes to build homes. Have you heard a peep since? Uh, yeah, it's, it's exactly where it is with all these new homes that they're building. It doesn't <laughs> exist. No, nothing happens. It's lip service without any type of um, credibility or responsibility or accountability. Um, okay, quick. Last here, just want to touch on Alberta, our uh, province, sister province here to the east. Both Calgary and Edmonton are seeing, guess what, record high sales volumes. Um, <laughs> both cities have, are already at all-time highs uh, for the whole year with another month of sales as well. Um, they're seeing prices increase slightly, you know, uh, rising waters kind of lift all ships, if you will. And, and Calgary seen about uh, 9% and Edmonton 4%. Um, yes, this is coming off of about a seven year flat market, but they are poised to have a pretty strong 2022. And I mm -hmm. think we'll maybe touch on that a bit too on uh, the Jan 1st podcast, but for now, that is it for today's episode. Thanks as always for watching and listening. We look forward to bringing you uh, the next two editions. They're going to be really fun and uh, probably some funny things to poke at us as well with our <laughs> 2021 predictions. But um, have a great holiday season and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Hey dude, get out of here. Okay, I'm running. Thanks. Thanks.